Hello, I'm Dr. Diane Breckeridge, and with me is Dr. Marion Zavala. I come from Mervyn M. Ginley School of Nursing and Charles R. Drew University in Los Angeles, California. I came to the university in 2018 as the dean and professor this semester as we are bringing forth a DMP program as well as a generic bachelor's of science in nursing program. My major responsibilities is to get them up and running because we got approval for the bachelor's program for the fall and also by our regional accreditor for the DNP. So it's a fast track. I have with me, as I said, Dr. Marion Savala. She is the chapter president in New York City for the non. And she just got elected to a second chapter in New York City. She is from Concordia University as a professor there, as well as she is also at Columbia University as adjunct. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Savala. Thank you, Diane. There are four learning objectives in this module. Describe the essential steps when planning a mentoring program and rationales. Assess current mentoring activities occurring at your organization. Develop a purpose statement for your mentoring programs with rationale. And lastly, develop broad goal statements for your mentoring program with rationales. Okay. This image provides the essential steps which can be easily followed in developing a model. When you design a program, keep in mind who are your audience. So you have to identify your audience. Are they going to be undergraduate students, graduate students, students who are first in their family to attend college, or are they ESL students and other type of audiences that you would like to have? And then when you are going to um, set up goals, obviously it's gonna be relative to your audience. And when you have your format, are you going to have an informal format of your program? Will it be semi-structured or structured? When you move on to the uh, next step, uh, as you recruit mentors, are you going to recruit mentors from the same discipline or various disciplines? Are you going to recruit alumni, peers? And obviously you have to provide training because the mentors need to know what's their expectation and that will help the program to be successful. In the uh, next essential step, as you connect mentors and mentees, what process are you going to use when you're matching them up? Are you going to look at the mentor's application and mentee's application and match them up? Or will your approach be that the mentees will um, select their mentors? As you are guiding the mentoring relationship because you want to ensure success, are you gonna require periodic check-ins to determine if there are any issues? And lastly, when you're going to look at the outcomes, this is where you identify lessons learned. What will you do better for the next program? According to Dr. DeWitty, you should conduct a mentoring program assessment. Here's when you're going to identify what resources you have. And when you do that, that will be able to shape the type of program you'll be able to offer the mentees. Keep in mind the following statement when you are designing your program. According to Dallas, we advance in the company of those who preceded us, who laid down the path. Mentors motivate the mentees to surpass their current capabilities. To start with program assessment and expand on what you already do at your inner institution, Dr. DeWitty has an excellent mentoring program toolkit. And I highly recommend that you move forward and look at that in the binders that you will all be receiving. The work that is next is the risk assessment profile strategies for success 
It was the students of Philadelphia who worked with me in their interviews that they came up with the racks. They said, back then, I wasn't professor at the time, and I was just moving forward for my doctorate in 1992. And they said, how about it be the RAPS tool? So that's where the name came from of the RAPS, because it was a risk assessment profile, strategies for success. When I interviewed students over the years, even prior to 1992, I noticed that there were different areas that they had challenges as they were going to come into a nursing program or a pre-nursing nursing intent program. It was that work that I had done that I took to University of Maryland where I did go for my PhD in nursing. And it was there that I was able to do the content analysis necessary under my mentors there and bring forth the risk assessment profile strategies for success. So it has a major emic perspective, the perspective of the students. Yes, I did correlate it with the literature. I did go to the literature also at the time. And I've continued to do so with interviews as well as with the literature. As far as the strategies for success program itself, that begins with the upper classmates mentoring the pre-nursing students. That whole approach is then making sure that the students feel comfortable if they have a peer mentor, if they have a person in the university, in the school of nursing that they feel comfortable with. That is the most important component to make sure we have the student's perspective. When we're referring for tutoring, because someone is moving forward in a situation where their pass rates are getting lower as far as 80% in coursework, we do not want any students to not have that positive approach. And that's why when I brought this program forth, it was called Strategies for Success. The risk assessment occurred when my mentor said to me down at University of Maryland, you got to have a problem before you put in for grant funding. So let's call those indicators the risk. So I did, but I had to keep that strategies for success with it to keep that positive approach. So no student feels embarrassed or concerned that they're going to a tutoring center. And that was my, I'm gonna say dream to have what would be called a strategies for success center. And those types of centers are all over today, as we all know. And there's many people, even back when I started working on this, that were working on these approaches. So we all know that it's the work of many people. When we talk about having a village to create the approaches we need, that's the whole point. So again, this whole idea is that we keep things positive, but realistic. So if a student does wind up in a testing situation for standardized testing and they're dipping too low, then we definitely want them really at the level three. That would be the best predictor. Level two, when they start dipping, we need to give them more reinforcement, even another exam. And then we move right back to that whole idea of peer mentoring. When I put the strategies for success program together in the development of the strategies for success program. I knew we needed a case manager to work with the students about any of the challenges that they have. We need a data manager to make sure we have the outcomes so that we can revise our programs based on the students and the faculty and the tutors who are working with the students. And then we always need the appropriate amount of clinical instructors, faculty, and tutors. And I'm very pleased to say in the 
almost three years at Charles R. Drew University. It was just reported by our provost that we now have 11 tutors. That's a definite increase and it's wonderful. And I think that's the positive attitude we all need to keep in mind. Make sure that we keep it positive for the outcomes of our students to do the best they can. So there is a two prone approach here, and I call it two components of entry into nursing. There is the group of students who say, I wanna go into nursing, but I don't have all the prerequisites done or my prerequisite grades are a little too low, or I have not taken the standardized admissions exam, which is important because we are a standardized profession. We're at the end of our nursing programs for a student graduate to then become an RN, they need to take the NCLEX, and it is a standardized test. So we have to keep in mind that a standardized admission test, I am a proponent of working with the students to understand where they are in taking those exams. It may take more than one, two, even three times for them to feel comfortable taking the exams and have the support services they need. And as far as I have been concerned through my entire career, I do not mind test retest so that as long as we have appropriate strategies to help with student anxiety situations taking exams. And I'm proud to say that when I was on the East Coast, two of my colleagues put together an entire program on decreasing anxiety for student testing. And it had to do with pet therapy and it was presented at the National League for Nursing. When we had the students come in, I was able with one of the HRSA grants that I received to develop the 20 workshop sessions. And these workshop sessions range all the way from students having increasing competencies with learning management systems, whether one is using Blackboard or Canvas or another one, all the way to expressing what diversity and outreach means to them. And to do so with the diversity and outreach, that is the essay that we do at Building Blocks with the essay writing approaches so that students are more equipped to write an essay as well as to do APA format or the format that is expected of that school. The other area is the presentations of the work they're doing so that they are increasing their abilities with public speaking. And the area that I think is so important that we do in partnership with our students, assess what their needs are for tutoring so that they understand it's not a negative, it's not a situation they cannot overcome. We need to know where they are when they can't get that grade they need in anatomy and physiology so we can get them the appropriate tutoring. Then then they meet their entry requirements, they move to the second component. That second component is the retention. We bring the students into nursing, we want them to stay. We want them to be with us. And I am also proud to say that working together with our students, our faculty, our administration at Charles R. Drew University, we've been able to bring forth 97% retention. And I am so proud of all that are working together. It is the faculty that say, mm, the students just need a little more help. And then that last part, that prescription for success, what we've done in many programs, especially where I am now, we've taken that learning contract and we've changed it into a success contract. This is what you need to be successful, but it has to be in partnership with us. You tell us what would work. We work with you. We help you find a mentor. We help you find a peer group so that you can meet the requirements you need 
and the competencies you need. Another area, especially because of COVID pandemic, is our situation of students needing a computer in their home setting with their camera. And we're finding more and more of our students just cannot resource that. And therefore we have an excellent system so that the students are able to come forth. And I notice they feel a little embarrassed at first and we do not want that to ever occur. We want them to feel like they can come forth. So we have many, many forums and student and faculty meetings where they can feel comfortable informing us of their needs. And therefore that very important area progressing in each nursing course, graduating as close to on time as possible. But again, if a student has a situation, they need to work with us on a new program of study and their success prescription of their plan, then we do that so that they do not feel bad about themselves if life gets in the way and they need to take a semester to do so and have support during that time. And the last to join that nursing workforce, and we've been able to work very closely with our students and our clinical sites for this to happen. In the manual that you will receive, there is the risk assessment profile, the different areas that are listed. Now, the ones here are the ones from the beginning. So today with prerequisites, many schools, even our school have gone to seven years for the prerequisites to be completed, such as the science prerequisites and many have psychology in that area also. As far as we take it a prerequisite course to obtain a C or a C plus with added research, a B is what most of the prerequisites are today and where we are today, even at Charles R. Drew University. Again, making sure that whatever entrance exam it is, that the student is within that acceptable level. And again, making it clear to the students that if they are below, we are here for them. We have tutoring sessions for that. There's plenty of online materials to increase one's competencies in those areas. We can work with students with a counselor if they have high anxiety taking an exam because when one looks at the end of nursing, they need to take the exam to become an RN. And so we do it from a positive standpoint. The grades that are predictive of NCLEX success are the clinical courses, but there's even more than just the clinical courses. When I have made sure that programs such as the one at Charles R. Drew University have added community, leadership, and the um, critical thinking exams. It makes a difference. I am very proud to say that we just received word of 94% and CLEX pass rate for 19, um, excuse me, for 19 to 20, so 2019 to 2020, it was 91.43. And this has risen in the three years that I have been at Charles R. Drew University from an 83 to this level. The science GPA is the strongest predictor. We did raise from a B minus to a B. And again, we are accepting those students who do retake the, um, the course to get to the B. There's also significant correlations between standardized comprehensive exams, such as the ones that are here, and there's others also. And it's mainly when you assess the situation, it's that engagement making sure the students and the faculty are engaged and they have buy-in into the standardized testing system that's being used and having a spreadsheet and making sure that no names are on the spreadsheet 
but that they understand this is the data and the outcomes that have occurred. And when we do have that increased engagement, usually within one year after the engagement, we see a movement into the 90s. I've seen that over and over. But you have to have that engagement. And you need champions that believe in it. And again, there are schools where some people will say, well, let's use this one and then let's change this one and go back and forth. I think making sure you have a standardized system and you work with that and you use evidence to make any decisions. Best outcomes for mentors to determine evidence of competencies. Hispanic nursing student mentees are so important. And we are very... I'm pleased that at our School of Nursing, we have an immediate past president of NON for Los Angeles, and that's Dr. Feriosa. And she makes sure she lets us know whenever there is an event, and we make sure we have as many students as we're able to send. One of the major events where Jean Watson was the speaker just a year, a few months right before, the COVID pandemic, and many of us were off-site then, was right near Los Angeles. And we had three tables of students who received scholarships, received awards. We take this very seriously because SPA 6, which is the service planning area of Los Angeles in South Los Angeles, has 76% Hispanic population. And it is a very under-resourced area. And this is so important to our students and to our community members. I call them neighbors, our neighbors. As we move ahead to them, we make sure that the peers are either their own classmates or upper classmates. We try to go with the upper classmate. That's why when we have our meetings, we make sure that at some of those meetings, all the student reps are there from the cohort that just comes in to the cohort that's graduating. So they can share their best solutions and their contributions. But it's also fine to have another university student or a role model at the university. And our alumni are just amazing. We have so many alumni that come back to the other programs, such as our nurse practitioner programs, after becoming an RN. And that's what we're expecting for our DMP program. So I think that's so important to really keep track of those students and then have them be at panels so that the lower classmates can choose them as their mentors. And that's what we do a lot of. And also, we want to have the clinical preceptors and the nurses that are in the field and in the hospitals be their mentors. And that has happened also. And we invite all of our clinical preceptors and clinical instructors and the nurses on those floors or units to all of our continuing education. Now, we might only get 18 out of hundreds, or we might even only get two out of let's say 50 or 60, but even one is worth it. And that's how I see it. And I know my team sees it. Progress to each nursing course, graduation rates within that plan of study time and the major area. Please, we say to the students, do not use the NCLEX RN exam as a practice exam. Practice with the systematic testing system we have and have that first attempt, you're confident, your predictor level is high, because that is much better for you and for the school, because you'll be more pleased with your outcomes. We don't want anyone to be embarrassed. And if they do not pass, we want them to come right to us and not be embarrassed. We'll see what the situation is and we'll help you work through it because there will be a time where a student will not pass. We recognize that. The preventive interventions that decrease the failure rates among ethnic minorities. 
the remediation programs at community and four-year colleges. The child care, child care is so important. That is in my, the risk assessment profile because students that do have children, if they do not have someone to take care of their child or the daycare doesn't open early enough, what are they to do? So we discuss that again as a positive. And one of the examples at one of the programs where I was, the couple students could not get to clinical on time and one of the faculty members. And I found out that the daycare right down the street from the hospital was not open until 7 a.m. and they needed to be in between 6.30 and quarter of seven. So I went to the daycare with some other people and we convinced them to open at 6.30 and they didn't even charge them more. So it was a win-win and everything worked out for the students and that faculty member. We then moved ahead and did our own daycare at the um, hospital and the School of Nursing where I was on the East Coast. And that is so wonderful to do that. That's back at Abington Memorial Hospital. It is now part of the Jefferson healthcare system. And we worked together to make, have that happen. And it came from the students and the faculty in the interviews that I was able to have not just myself anymore do, but many other people do. So we work together as a team. As we move forward then, the other areas such as student services for students with disabilities, so important. This is one of my major areas that I've been very interested in since back in 1992 when I went on for my doctorate. I am very um, proud to say that one of our students back in 1983 that I accepted in this group that did these interviews, she is one of the major tutors that I've had in my program. She walks with a cane. She was accepted into the nursing program and she was able to complete all of her requirements. We had another student who had braces on her arms. We padded her arms during obey so she could still lift the babies and everyone gave her rave reviews. This can happen and we need to work more and more with our students, especially related to disabilities. Move on to the next please. Evidence-based outcomes are so important and the survey done by Marin, Bailey and Amiri of 832 nursing program administrators bring forth that if you have a higher percentage of full-time faculty, the outcomes are better for the first time pass rate. And I think this is really important to work with your administration to have that higher percentage of the full-time faculty. Boards of nursing do expect in beer and approved programs to have a minimum of 51% full time. Now that doesn't mean we don't have a lot of adjuncts that are in the clinical setting, but we're talking about the faculty that are at the university, at the school, that are with our students every day in case a student needs that help in hand. Or an adjunct faculty member cannot be with the students because of an unfortunate situation so that the full-time faculty are able to at least step in to direct the students appropriately if they've driven all the way to the school or they've gone all the way to a clinical site instead of having to turn around after they've paid for daycare as well as gotten to that site. This is very important. As far as schools that do not require standardized exams as part of their admission criteria, that was done in the 80s into the 90s. And if all the other predictor prerequisites are handled, there could be schools then that do have good outcomes. But what we have to keep in mind is nursing is a profession that has standardized tests. Throughout 
the program and then when one needs to pass the NCLEX or even if they're in a nurse practitioner program, they want to pass the national certification exam for a nurse practitioner. Therefore, other professions such as medical school and others have standardized tests throughout their programs as well as before. And I think we need to really take this into consideration. And again, by doing it from a positive standpoint, which I have looked at in the work that I have done and worked with others and keeping it positive and it doesn't keep you out of school, but it helps us with you to make sure you're able to take a standardized test so that you do have a better retention and then a better predictability of passing the NCLEX. So I definitely think this is excellent work, this evidence-based outcomes work, and we do need to continue with this conversation and make decisions based on the evidence. The students at risk for adverse academic events I was fortunate to have been asked to put the work that I had related to risk assessment into the Encyclopedia of Nursing Education by Dr. Fitzpatrick. And again, I really wanted to make sure it also said strategies for success. So she at least left the strategies for success part, a positive approach in these three pages. So I was very happy with that. And you would be able to see the program in those passages. The Breckenridge, Wolf, and Roskowski, the risk assessment profile strategies for success instrument and determining pre-licensure nursing students, risk for academic success. That comes from the HRSA grant that I had at, on the East Coast at LaSalle University. And this was an excellent outcomes piece showing that science courses and English comprehension without repeating to obtain a B is the best outcome. That is only one study again, but it was over 500 students. We had a very large program in um, the East Coast at LaSalle University. We had over a thousand students in the program. And I think it's very important that we did this work to determine back in 2012. There's more work that is being done now that will be coming forward with the work I've done here on the West Coast in Los Angeles. So the value of mentoring includes that individual and group educational strategies for success sessions, independent computer modules, that tutoring, that mentoring, and the NCLEX test map. And when you have a testing system, and there's the HESI, but there's also the ATI, and that's the system we're using right now. This is what ensures success. And having the students a part of it, having a mentoring program where their mentor is a part of looking at and assessing their situation so that they can be more successful is key. Providing the clinical training experiences for Hispanic nursing students in community-based primary care through partnerships with alumni nurses, so important. We are very committed at Charles R. Drew University to make sure that our students are with clinical mentors and preceptors. Continuing professional development in primary care for practice and RNs such as having clinical preceptors and mentors and faculty address the topics of relevance that the students are very concerned with and that we're seeing right now, even during COVID-19. We came up with a whole model of how they could continue with their clinical experiences related to being at the COVID testing sites and now at the vaccination sites and still rotating through their direct patient care hospital sites. That publication um, has been accepted 
um, when I put together what's called the NERP model, Nursing Education Practice and Research. And that is coming forth in the, um, the Nurse Educator Journal. Recruiting is so important to recruit and orient Hispanic nursing students committed in practicing in non-institution settings to provide access to primary health care in the medically and healthcare underserved areas, to develop and maintain specialized recruitment activities to attract Hispanic students and provide risk assessment to new and existing RNs, to identify challenges and barriers, to assist them through mentoring, to overcome their situations. We right now are working very closely with the pastors in South Los Angeles, as we are trying to work with the 76% Hispanic population, our neighbors, to make it really clear that we can work with them as they are tested for COVID and receive the vaccination. That is so important today. And there is the mistrust of communities. We know that. But nurses are always at the very top end of the Gallup Bowl for being the most trustworthy and ethical to the public. And we need to make sure the nurses are in those situations, and that's what we are doing. Provide the pre-nursing boot camps that are consistent of the sessions on a variety of topics and structure and learning activities online and in person to mentor students in increasing pre-licensure entrance exams. So we are having pre-nursing boot camps during the pre-sessions I went over, but we have post-nursing boot camps. We have those for our pre-licensure students, for any students that do not get the higher predictors, as well as for our nurse practitioner students. And I'm happy to report that our nurse practitioner pass rates have come up from 68 to then 79 the first year I was there at Charles R. Drew University, and now 82 the second year, and we're trending 91. We're going to try to get in the 90s. And this is what becomes contagious. Everyone works together. Everyone has something to do with making this happen. The mentors do, the students do, and the faculty. And we move forward together and we're seeing outcomes. And I've seen this, whether I've been on the East Coast or even in Phoenix and New Mexico when I had the opportunity to be in those states. And I know many, many are seeing these same situations because I see the literature that's coming out with the evidence and all the excitement that's occurring at NON and how we're working closely together. So what does success look like in pre-nursing to meet those entrance requirements for the nursing program? The work that I was fortunate to be able to do since 1988 and started to write more about and present more about strategies for success. Back in Philadelphia, I worked with the public school system and was able to at first go in with the guidance counselors in the 11th and 12th grades to make sure the students had the right courses to go on for nursing. But then I was able to move forward to the fifth and sixth grade groups. And then we started doing reading programs about health professionals to the third graders and above. We were able to put together a health professions entire program and building in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, our state capital back in Pennsylvania. And this is the goal to make sure we have health professions and nursing right there in every state so everyone can work together to help those that want to become a nurse be a nurse. And that meeting these entrance requirements, having these boot camps, working together for that to happen with our Hispanic 
population, which is so important in many of our states throughout the nation. An area that was very important to me and coming to California, basically full-time six years ago, and also to Arizona and New Mexico and working specifically with the Hispanic population has definitely been so important because it is the students that are Hispanic, just like many of our other students who really want to become nurses. And I want them to become nurses. I wanted to be a nurse from the time I was four years old. And it was an army nurse. And she was in World War II, which is in Arlington Cemetery today. And I said, I'm going to be a nurse just like my Aunt Anne. And that is what we hear in our pipeline programs of our students. And that is what we want to help them achieve. Give it on. At this time, I would like Dr. Savala to continue. To ensure success, you should be using SMART goals. Why? Because SMART goals provide clarity, it provides direction, action goals, and it will help you motivate your audience, your students, by being specific. What do you expect from them? That provides clarity. For measurable is what evidence are you going to use to determine that you're progressing or not progressing? Achievable, are those goals doable? Are they realistic? Do you have resources to achieve your goals? And relevant, how relevant is the goal to your organization? So nursing program, you want your nursing students, for instance, to pass the, the exam, pass the course, pass the program, and pass NCLEX and get a job. And in what time, um, in what time span do you want to achieve um, those goals? Is your mentorship program uh, developed for six months, one year, two years? You decide what's best for your program. Here we're going to discuss, I'm going to discuss uh, some types of mentoring programs. Dr. DeWitties has a mentoring program toolkit, which is absolutely wonderful and we have been using. Torres Suarez developed a mentorship program that is being used by the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. There, the mentors and mentees are selected. They meet each other and the mentees get to select who they prefer and then the decision is made. In Texas, there's a mentoring program called Juntos Podemos, Together We Can. The program facilitated mentor-protege relationship among students to prepare Hispanic nurses to serve in underserved areas. And you've been listening to Dr. Breckenridge discuss the success to achieve a baccalaureate degree. In this slide, it has one strategy for mentoring and that is encourage relationships between Hispanic pre-nursing students and Hispanic nurses because you want them to start getting used to what nursing is about. Another strategy is uh, having National Association Hispanic Nurses members as mentors. I am a member of NON and I've uh, been serving as a, a mentor to others. So students involved in this organization attend local, uh, state, national meetings. We have national conferences. Um, we just had the Latino Leadership Institute at the beginning of February. Faculty can also serve as mentors Mentors can also be upperclassmen, alumni, clinical site nurses, mentors in underserved communities. And this is a win-win situation for both because the mentees can experience what an underserved community is and also be helping the mentors as they continue in their mentorship relationship. For student mentoring, uh, Dr. Breckenridge discussed her success model and their support services like a liaison between the mentors and mentees to help them in um, enhanced curriculum that includes strategies for success approach is an individualized plan to determine best practices for linking students to best mentors for best practice. 
outcome. Now, this is the same thing as we care for our patients. We have individualized care plan. Lastly, we should have individualized strategies for success for each of our mentees. Why is mentoring important? Crisp et al. conducted a literature review of articles from 2009 to 2017, and it suggested that mentoring is positively correlated with academic progress, persistent, and degree completion. Bettinger and Baker in 2011's uh, article show that non-traditional students across multiple universities who were mentored were more likely to persist to their second year of their college journey. Thank you, Dr. Savala. When we speak about students' perceptions about mentoring, I have been very clear, I feel, in the work that I have done to have been able to do a lot of qualitative work, hearing what the students think is best for them, what their families think is best for them, and what the faculty believe is best for them, and the mentors, especially if we're working with a specific population of students, such as the Hispanic Nurses Association and Hispanic students. I was very fortunate in 1992 when I showed the work at my doctoral program that I had already done and needed much more guidance, as I said, and be mentored also in bringing it together. For the um, head of the program was Dr. Betty Lentz at University of Maryland, and she said, we usually only allow quantitative research, but you have a lot of background in quantitative research already. So we're going to put you with a person who mainly does qualitative research. And that was Dr. Catherine Kavanaugh, who wrote the book on diversity in nursing. And it was like the best day, one of the best days of my career, because I have a lot of good days, I must say, because I am an optimist. And with that said and done, when I was able then to even hear about more students' perceptions and what they thought was best for them, and mentoring always came up, how students feel they can get through their situations. And having a mentor is the number one situation. And how they say it, sometimes they say it, someone to give them a helping hand, someone to be there to guide them, someone to help them through the rough times, someone that will step in and be their advocate. But in the end, it means a mentor. And therefore, having a database for ongoing and substantive program evaluations of student perceptions and what works for students. So in my early days, we used what was called the nudist system, the nudist qualitative, and we would put in all the interviews and then the concepts would emerge. And that is how I originally developed the instrument of risk assessment profile strategies for success. What works in boot camps? When we ask the students in the pre-nursing program of the 20 sessions, what worked the most for you? Then we adjusted it. And then today, to have a more contemporary name using boot camp seems to be the interim because even some of the high school students from the pipeline program that meet with me weekly, they say to me they have boot camps for their science courses over at the magnet school at our corner, the Martin Luther King High School for Medicine and Science. As we move forward with the formalized partnership protocols in regard to clinical training experiences, it is just a pleasure to meet all the time with the nurses and the directors and those at Kaiser Permanente, Cedar sinai St. Francis right around the corner from us, PIH where our students also like to go in Whittier near Los Angeles, 
but newly is when the chief nurse administrator of the LA Children's Hospital got in touch with me through LinkedIn. And within a minute, I sent right back. And now we have an affiliation agreement there. And the students are so happy because they not only have in the hospital, but also their COVID testing site. As we're moving forward then, we want to hear the students' perceptions. As I say every day to the students that I have the opportunity to by forums or cohort meetings or faculty meetings or university meetings or pipeline meetings, we need to hear the students' perceptions so that we have solutions. We need to hear the faculty perceptions so we have solutions because in the end, the mentoring is number one, and that is what we expect, and that is going to be the best as we move forward. Thank you. Here are some activities that you can implement by asking the following questions. Do you have an ongoing mentoring program for your students? Do you have a specific mentoring model that you follow? Do you have an individual or individuals designated as a mentor program, director, liaison, or program manager that mentors and mentees can go to with issues. Now, ment the mentoring program support, which is very critical that you would do after this uh, activities is in helping the students learning experiences be optimal and to help them become successful. So some of the activities that you could implement also are based on the following questions. Do you conduct evaluations of the mentoring process to determine if the mentoring relationship is working for both? And do you have a process dealing with issues that may occur? Uh, lastly, you have a post-program support because you want to retain the graduates in your field. Once a student graduate the program pass and collects are now being precepted in a hospital environment or similar environment, some of them has felt, um, and this is only anecdotal information, that they were questioning their decision to become nurses. Why? Because when they were nursing students, that was the perfect world. Now they're in the real world. So some of these activities can be implemented by the following questions. Do you have an active alumni association or network that interacts professionally and or socially with your graduates? Do you offer any graduate alumni mentoring programs? Do you have a mentor program that matches students with alumni mentors from the nursing profession and or nursing specialties? Thank you so much for attending module 3.1.